It's that time of year again. Halloween season. On Blood and Black Rum Podcast, we take this very seriously. So, we're going back to the basics with what we're calling Halloween East 2. Movies that take place on or around Halloween. Your favorites like Hocus Pocus, Ernest Scared Stupid, Terrifier, and more. Tune in all September and October as we smash jack-o'-lanterns and Oktoberfest in equal fashion. Hey guys, welcome back to the Blood and Black Rum Podcast. I'm Ryan from ColdSplitation.com, and I'm joined with my co-host, Martin. How's it going? Doing well. We have a another Halloween episode for you today, part of the Halloweenies 2 season here on Blood and Black Rum Podcast. And I must say, we have a pretty ribald episode <laughs> awaiting our fans here. Following the tradition of a spooky and a fun episode, we just did a fun episode with the uh, WNUF Halloween special. And today we're going back to spooky, kind of, maybe. Kind, kind of, yeah, kind of. Uh, going back to, I guess you could call horror, you'd say horror. Spooky, maybe, maybe not, probably. But I'd say it's more spooky than horror. It's got the supernatural element to it. Yeah, um, it's, uh, we're, it's one of those movies where... We wanted to cover this one because for Halloweenies, you know, again, we're doing movies that take place on or around Halloween, the Halloween season, uh, going back to, you know, the nostalgic element of Halloween on in your film. Uh, and so for this one, you know, the name itself evokes a lot of Halloween ideas um, and it takes place around Halloween for sure. But the, the idea of this movie is basically a slasher type element uh where you know they they do the su- the whole supernatural idea kind of akin to something like a nightmare before uh a nightmare before Chris, a nightmare on elm street um similar to that s- style in that vein um which again at the time would have been extremely popular in 1986 when this movie was released um you know, so you've got the slasher element, you've got supernatural horror uh, that's, you know, making headway. Um, so this film kind of sits right in the middle of that. And not only that, but they had to go one step further than some of the other movies that had released around this time. You know, many slasher movies worked in heavy metal into their uh, their soundtracks, at least. Or you might you might have had one tie-in song, big song. The biggest one ever is... Nightmare on Elm Street 3. Yeah. Dream Warriors. With Dokken. I don't know, though. I don't know, though. I mean, yes, that is the one that we think of the most, of course. But there's also um, a really great one in the next Nightmare on Elm Street movie. Is it, is it actually, is it four or is it five? Let me, I gotta, I gotta look it up now. You know what? Yeah. The fact that we were, I was able to call Dan Dock and off you know the bench that quick and now you're struggling for like no wait this one's better i am i mean you know in my opinion this one is better than docking but the fact you can't recall it that quick shows that you just don't care i know i know i mean it used to be one that i um would go back to over and over again because it's it's a super catchy song um and i'm just not sure which one it's in i couldn't remember if it was in uh four or five for uh, a nightmare on Elm street. Um, but it's drama Rama's anything, anything, you know, that song probably, but I mean, it doesn't ring a bell, but it's the same thing too, that, um, like I think I've said before when we've randomly brought up doc and Lee Swans, um, I didn't know until I heard a bunch of Dawkins songs that it was even like by Dawkins because I work with the Dawkins fan and I was like, Oh, I know a lot of these songs. Why have I never heard on the radio, like, after, like on a classic rock block, like, hey, 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 here's our heavy metal block with Megadeth, Metallica, and Dockin. You know, they leave Dockin off. Like, that was Megadeth, Metallica, and some other <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, I mean, that's always a fun one. Like I said, they they worked it in quite a bit. This was, like, a right around the time where heavy metal was really... Uh, getting featured quite heavily on the soundtracks and would have, you know, like one specific soundtrack song on it that'd be like, 
Yeah, that's the soundtrack for the movie. Um, I'm thinking of a metal band from Roadhouse. No, no, that's the... Uh, no, I mean, that that metal, you can call them metal. <laughs> it is, it's hair metal. It's hair metal. No, this one, though, like, they, they have... It's, again, Dramarama in uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 4. I was right the first time, by the way. It's 4. <laughs> Um, it's great because it's got a nice montage of the kid doing karate as well. It's an, it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, but anyway, back to back to the film at hand that we're talking about. Um, yeah, I mean, this one in, it went a little bit further in that it basically revolved around fucking metal in general. It was like we're gonna make a movie, a horror movie, and it's all about heavy metal. Um, you know, these kids. That's called, called heavy metal. Yeah, the other movie, heavy metal. Uh, the kid's obsessed with me- heavy metal, hair metal. He's uh, kind of become a, almost like a, I don't know, like a hermit who just wants to listen to metal and been abused by his friends and uh, by his peers, I should say. And uh, yeah, that's the movie. This is a heavy metal icon and t- maybe talk about how heavy metal can be a corrupting force and sometimes heavy metal uh, has deep anti-Christian morals and things like that and yeah we'll, we'll cover all the bases though the I guess the only other thing that they didn't work in that on the nose uh, is the satanic influence um, which they kind of kind of do make mention of with the whole playing the record backwards and stuff but uh, in, in reference to like 6 6 I don't go the full 666, but uh, it's just missing the satanic panic, I think, um, to, to hit like all like the trifecta of things that you would cover in the 80s like that. And also, I would say also, too, it is topical because uh, right around that time, you had uh, PMRC, uh, Tipper Gore's group, the Parents Music Resource Center, testing against uh, this type of music that was satanic and, uh, you know, Sexual and graphic yep. and immoral. And yep. That, you ended up having a cavalcade of people showing up at Congress for these meetings, like uh, D. Snyder, D. Being, Snyder the, being the big, big one. Yeah. And Frank Zappa and John Denver for Rocky Mountain High of all things. You know, <laughs> if you're like, you know, this is fucking stupid. But, you know, it's looking back, I mean, it's a little blip on the radar, but I mean, the satanic panic is, you know, was. Especially in the '80s, you know, in the Reagan mid Reagan years, where it's a damn big thing, and with the AIDS outbreak and all that, you know. Yeah, I mean, the PMRC does definitely factor into this, of course. So, you know, the the end of this movie, we'll talk about how that kind of comes up later on. But uh, and it was formed in 1985, and this movie released in 1986. So yeah, it was certainly to some extent influenced by the formation of the PMRC. Um, and discussion of how metal can be violent or riddled with sexual connotations, things like that. Um, so yeah, I guess we should introduce the movie. We're talking about 1986's Ragman, but you probably know it better by Trick or Treat. Which is a terrible name for this film. On Wikipedia, it doesn't cite it, but if this is true as a title in other foreign markets... Death at 33 RPMs is a much better name. I mean, that one kind of really gets you... That's literally awesome. And... Puts you in the right mood, right? And also, too, be great now because kids today, with knowing nothing about records, the fuck's... I don't know. What does that that, mean? that is a cool, uh, it's a cool name. It actually almost sounds like a fucking cross between a giallo and uh, Agatha Christie story. You know, like Death on the Nile. Death at 33. <laughs> yeah. This is why it's a murder she wrote. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. That's the, kind of what it sounds like. <laughs> awesome. But it's a, it is a cool name, it is. Uh, it's definitely better than either of the two names. Yeah, Ragman's terrible, which also, too, like, uh, the fact that our kid... And the bar protagonist, this is called, you know, his nickname is Ragman. Why? Who calls you Ragman? Nobody. So why are you like, that's my alter ego. I'm Ragman. I'm I'm the super bus boy. I go around after you're done eating at the local diner and I go, 
I start scrubbing down the tables. Let my hand, because I'm the rag. Yeah, it would have been nice if we got some sort of ridiculous uh, backstory about it like that. It's almost like, like you know, Danny DeVito in the wrestling episode of It's Always Sunny. I'm the, I'm the trash man. I, I come to the ring and I throw garbage everywhere. And then I bop him on the head with my trash can. I don't know how you eat. I know. It's, it's, and like you said, Ragman is not a good name for this movie, but it would make sense because they do say Ragman, I think, maybe one time. I think Gene Simmons is like the only person in this movie his to refer to him as Ragman. His plates on his car say Ragman. So he, that means he went down to the DMV. He's like, yeah, I need some vanity plates with you guys' license. Like, yeah, what do you want? He's like, Ragman. So <laughs> a woman had to finally look at him and be like, really? He had to spend uh, five extra dollars and get the vanity plates. <laughs> just, just like, really? Yeah, really, Ragman. What the, um, what the fuck does that mean? Honestly, Ragman kind of sounds like he's a fucking jazz musician. He's like, you know, hitting the sax. It's Dan Ragman over there. It's Ragman. It's Scatman Corrado. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. Second, second brother-in-law. I know. He's really, uh, good, at play. He's really, playing, really good at playing the jazz kazoo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, the other, I mean, Trick or Treat is not a good name either because this literally has zero trick or treating. I, oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It has 1% trick or treating. I forgot that one little girl that comes to the door in the movie and says, Trick or Treat, come with me. He's like, come back tomorrow. <laughs> it was a pretty good one. But anyway, like, no, yeah, it's, it's Trick or Treat's a bad name. And um, before we go into our beer, I'll just say this and then we'll we'll take the break there. But I do feel like in this movie, and I don't, I really, this is the first time I've ever seen Trick or Treat. I've never, I don't know anything about it. I haven't, you know, watched any extra features or done any research on the backstory behind it. But I will say that I feel like the element of Halloween was added as an afterthought in this movie. That, that Halloween itself, they, maybe they didn't, maybe they had to even do reshoots because a lot of times the film makes no mention of Halloween at all. It literally is like a. Uh, there's like two scenes in the movie that have anything to do with Halloween. So I almost feel like no. they wrote a movie, they wrote it as Ragman. It had no Halloween in it, and they were like, "No, we need something. We need like this movie is as Halloween as Haddonfield." Okay. So don't don't less less don't, so don't even start. It's less so. It's literally the same as Haddonfield, Illinois. Couldn't I've, tell the couldn't tell the difference. I mean, at least in Haddonfield, you see kids trick or treating, albeit at the ungodly hour of three p.m. But at least you see them trick or treating. In this, in this, it's not trick or treat. That's not trick or treat. <laughs> that's just prancing home from school, I guess you could say. But um, in this movie, you literally only see one trick or treater. Um, but we can we can talk about the Halloween we'll dig aesthetic. We'll yeah, dig into that a little late. We'll get good into that. So let's take a break real quick. Talk about the show that we have, or the the beer that we have on the show. Sorry, um, and I picked this one up. I got this one, so I, I guess I'll take it away. Um, I w- I was watching on TikTok. I followed the beer connoisseur, and he had done a little video review of uh some polliner that he'd received from the brewery and he kind of wanted to go through and identify the different styles of oktoberfest beers that that are available um specifically fest beer and your you know more american style Mar- marzen which we call marzen german speaking it would be marzen so we uh we're wrong yeah we we mispronounce probably but um I like to say Mars and it's easier. But anyway, uh, so he went through the, uh, you know, the, the different distinctions between Fesbier and Martzen or Marzen. And um, then he tried the various Polliners because Polliner actually makes a couple different beers. And they also make um, what we had on here previously, which was the... Um, For this year, too. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, kind of serendipitous that that happened. But um, the... Uh, what's that called? The... Uh, the Hacker Shore, Shore, uh, which we had on here, which was more of a, you know, Mars in style, um, in that in that vein of malty breadiness. Um, 
So he had that one, which they make. He had Polliner's um, Fest beer. And then he also had Polliner's Mars in style. And um, in America, we have those named a little bit differently. Um, so we have the Oktoberfest beer. So they kind of combine Oktoberfest and beer together to make Fest beer. And then we also have the Oktoberfest Marzen. Um, and for this show, I picked up the Oktoberfest beer. For one thing, because that was the only thing available. That's all that the shop had for Polliner. So they didn't even have the Marzen. But also because we haven't really done a Fest beer this year. Um, we've done pretty much all Marzens. So wanted to tackle this one and see what we thought about Polliner. Which, to, to kind of reiterate, for those who don't know, um, you know, we're a very layman. I mean, we love drinking our beer. We're layman for an aspect. But Marzins, though the traditional style of uh, Oktoberfest in Germany has kind of like fallen out of favor, because though it's a delightful beer... It can be a little taxing to drink with all its biscuity, bready goodness. So the Fest beer kind of came around because it's lighter and easier. In uh, America, as I say, in, in, in America, almost all when you're buying, for the most part, unless specified, when you buy at Oktoberfest, it is a Mersen style. Classic traditional style. Yep. Um, one thing that I found interesting that he pointed out, though, that I did, I guess I never really realized is that a fest beer is actually a higher alcohol content, generally around the 6%, whereas a Marzen is about 5%. So you ha- you do have the breadier, um, maltier elements to the Marzen and much heavier for drinking. But at the same time, you have the fest beer, which is a higher alcohol content, but you can drink more of it because it's lighter. So interesting, uh, interesting brewing um, backed for that. But anyway, for this fest beer, uh, Oktoberfest beer for Americans, um, this is a pretty classic style fest beer, I would say. It's, um, got a nice light character to it. There's, there are some hops to it that balance out, um, the maltier elements so it doesn't become too, uh, bready or heavy. Uh, so it does have lager characteristics, and for people who do like standard lagers, this is probably going to be close to a standard imported lager, but um, also has just a hint more malt to it. Um, you know, maybe a little bit heavier than a, a regular style lager, and that's pretty much how I I know a fest beer, and uh, I like it a lot. It's very drinkable, very easy to put down. Um, you can go through quite a few of these in a, in a time. And, uh, I think Polliner makes a really darn good fest beer, in my opinion. Yeah, I like it a lot. Like, I mean, we both agree because we have, you know, really similar tastes. And if you listen to our Oktoberfest episodes, you'll know. It's, you know, we like, we, we do prefer Marston's over fest beers, but I do think they have their place and they are, this is a damn delightful fest beer. It's very crisp, very easy to drink. You know, slightly... As I take a sip, you know, it's got, like, a little little bit of hoppiness to it. Nice, like, weediness to it. Like, gra- well, not weedy, but, like, grassiness to it. Uh, kind of like a Hellas lager. It's just really good. Really clean, really crisp. Goes down really easy. You know. Again, like, you know, they do have, like, uh, higher ABV... They're, they're a lot easier to kick back than, you know, Mars. And I do think, uh, out of all the Fest beers that I've had, I think this might be the best one so far. It's really crisp, easy to drink, and I have yet to have a bad beer from Polliner. And I think, like, according to my check-ins, this is my first Polliner. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but, uh... I don't think so, because, uh... <clears throat> well, speak of the devil... So when I had, like, the Mars in, like, five years ago, I think it was at the same time that season three of Better Call Saul was airing. So I bought the Paul and Eric, so I was like, I gotta try the Hefeweizen, the s- sample pack, because uh, poor Werner, after getting, you know, off by Mike, and, you know, him being like, no, it's Hefeweizen, 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 you know. And I was like, now, like, just like, uh, Poor uh, Mike, like, now, now, Vernon. Hell, now. <laughs> so, 
I think that's it's all coming back to me now. Which, by the way, if you have not watched Better Call Saul, fucking watch Better Call Saul. Do so. <laughs> kind of uh, led you on a little tangent there, but that's where the best parts of the show go. It's not really about what we're talking about. It's tangents. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know if I've had it or not. I, I, if I have, I haven't checked into it. Uh, but now I do need to check out, you know, for this year, I would really like to check out the Oktoberfest Mars as well, just to see what kind of differences there are between the two. Um, I think we're going to have to go down to Oktoberfest to do. Yeah, we're going to have to try to find it. Because I think the one place that you want to go does have this on tap as uh, Mars. Could be. Could be. So, yeah, we'll have to check that out. But I like the Fuss beer a lot as well. Um, it's just not, you know, for me, it's not my favorite style of Oktoberfest, but it's still, re- there's a place for it and it's really good, especially on warmer fall days. So check Paul and her out. I mean, I don't, I don't think they really need your support. They probably have enough support as it is, but still, if you like Oktoberfest, check it out. If, if there's one thing they can do better, the ditch the monk on your beer, ditch the monk and go for and a nice busty chest, uh, Busty barmaid like a Hofbrau, which uh, when I was at the store, uh, the, one of the beverage centers out in Ilian, home of Remington, uh, with a buddy, and we were checking beers, and we, the, I got to the Hofbrau section. I'm like, look, and that's how you know Hofbrau is good. Look at those six packs, chesty barmaids on every pack. That's right. That one guy, that one guy's there on his lead, leader hose, and but the main focus is the girls and their dirtles and their boobies popping out. <laughs> Is that is that Uncle Good or not? Don't know. Don't care. Got something to add to the spank bank. That's right. All right. Which Ryan's going to be also wearing when we go to Oktoberfest this week? A dirt. A dirndl? Yeah, I'd love to try to pull it off. It will look delightful. I'd give it a shot. I don't know if I. I'm not stacked up there, but I'll try anything once. You know what? Doesn't look like they have. Hall Owners Oktoberfest on tap. Bummer. But they have a spot in Lager, spot in Oktoberfest, Hofbrau Munchen. So. Perfect. Paul, they got Paul and Hefeweizen. They got a bunch of Hefeweizens. God bless. All right, so let's talk about trick or treat, shall we? It's in 33 RPMs. Death and th- yeah, he, you refuse to call it trick or treat anymore. You're just going to call it by its intended title. Yeah, so let's start off with that Halloween scale. I know we usually say it for later. Halloween scale of this film, it's a four out of ten. It's all uh, incredibly, it's incredibly paltry. I, I might even give it a three out of ten. I, I might give it a three. I, I feel like. It again, like I said, it was an afterthought, in at least in my opinion. It feels like they had to maybe reshoot a couple scenes to actually have it. And to be honest with you, the whole Halloween party scene that actually takes place where they go to the Halloween dance at the high school really seems unnecessary for one thing. It's kind of a waste of time. Um, which in this movie, I would say too that the movie does feel overly long, so probably could have skipped that Halloween party entirely. Um, because it see, it feels superfluous. It doesn't have um, the murder that something like A Nightmare on Elm Street 2 has where Freddy actually shows up at a party and just like fucking goes wild, just like ripping people to shreds here and there willy-nilly. This movie doesn't really have that. It's just kind of got like a couple electronic explosions and, they, and fucking um, the antagonist um, playing his guitar loudly and people are like, well, oh my God, that's... That- that seems like uh, Sammy Curry, but he's better than Sammy Curry. And like, who is he supposed to be? Who is uh, Sammy Curry supposed to be? As like a, like he just seems like he's like a lower rent Alice uh, Cooper. That's what I'm getting from it, especially with like all the poster artwork and stuff, where you see like him standing in profile and like staring down with his eyes. That all to me really seems a lot like Alice Cooper. That, so that would be my say, guess. So, so you mean to tell me in 1986 you couldn't get Al Scooper to just do this fuck? John Carpenter got him to do uh, Prince of Darkness for just a uh, just a few seconds. 
Hey, you're gonna be a homeless guy yeah. who says, "Say no more, say no more." <laughs> year, a year <laughs> later, in Princess Darkness, they, John Carpenter is like, "Yeah, you're a, you're a zombie homeless man." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's like, "Fine." No, yeah, no. It's, got, it is. They got him. And I was saying, it was it Wayne's World one or two where they got him to show up and be like, "That's right, Milwaukee is the land of a thousand lakes." It's 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 just weird that they didn't go for somebody that is actually known in the heavy metal community. Like they've got Gene Simmons and they've got Ozzy Osbourne here, and they they get cameos, but they didn't go with somebody who actually could sell the idea that oh hey they're in heavy metal. And like even so, if they wanted to have Sammy Kerr as a as a, a fake character, fine. But they could have had Alice Cooper just do Alice Cooper as Sammy Kerr in this movie. I'm not saying Tony Fields does a bad job. Um, well, it's Alice Cooper's in the first. Ah, uh, Wayne's World. How could I forget? <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying Tony Fields does a bad job. It's just that it just seems a little strange. It uh, would have been a lot more fitting if they just got somebody within the heavy metal scene. Right, right. Like, again, apparently Blackie Lawless from Lost was supposed to, you know, be Sammy Kerr. But I mean, like, you could have pulled any jabroni out to be Sammy Kerr. You know, you didn't need an actor. You could have had anybody. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I mean, I guess back to what I was saying, kind of, we kind of like jumped all around there. But so basically the Halloween party at the school seems like an afterthought as well. Cause really not. It's, it's a dance. Yeah. It's a dance. And then they do have a couple of scenes of like trick or treating. Um, we, you see Eddie's mom going out uh, to a Halloween party with her. Oh, boyfriend her boyfriend's the greatest shows up looking like a jabroni looking like kip from fucking uh uh napoleon dynamite hair slicked back and like die commie help me <laughs> <laughs> um like doing his best commando impression one thing i want to know too is in every single halloween movie you see the fucking parents going out on halloween night where are they going is there some sort of gigantic Halloween orgy taking place yeah. that all these parents know about that you haven't got invited yet? No, I haven't yet. You know what? I I think your kids have to be at least eight to get invited to these things. Do you eat ass? If I was getting invited to an adults-only Halloween party, you bet your you bet your bottom dollar I would eat ass. Pun intended. Guess what? That invite's on the way. Okay. <laughs> you got it. Okay, great. It's all you, No, it's not It's not the eight-year-old. It's, you gotta eat ass. Do you eat ass? Yeah, no. Come on in then. But I mean, like, even... Well, in, actually, in Hocus Pocus, they show you where they're going. And I think... I think I've... Well, we're doing Hocus Pocus. But I think I've talked about this, where we used to have a... A Halloween dance that my dad would put on. Um, at the firehouse. An orgy. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was for kids and adults. Uh, there probably was a back... You know, back alley orgy action for the. I do parents, remember go, but, going there at least once or twice. Yeah, yeah. So like, but I do. I like. I love that in every single Halloween movie, you've got the parents who are like, "We're going out. We'll see you later." And the kids are always the ones that are like staying home. They're like, mm, "It's fucking Halloween. So Don't stay in home." So, what, so what's better now, that or the now try and true tradition of kids being hauled out of golf cart route for trick or <laughs> with kit with parents having wine in hand and or yeah. beer in hand. Absolutely, that is what's happening now. Yeah, fucking uh, throw them on the back of the trailer, <laughs> haul them down the street, drinking with your yeti. It's literally the saddest thing in the world. But also, also the most millennial thing. I agree. I mean, uh, we can't do anything fun along because we've got the fucking kids. I know. Strap them into the tractor. We're gonna haul a trailer down the road. And we're just gonna drink on the way. Like, yeah. Grab, grab your Yeti. <laughs> I know, I know. It is sad. It is sad. Come on, kids. Dad's gotta drink his bush, but he doesn't want to have to drive. I know. I drive. You, you kids just hop on the trailer and you know go for a ride. You know, I like my drinking as much as the next person, but I can abstain for two hours during trick or treat <laughs> you know what I mean we'll see we'll see this year if the kids are at that hot spot where you're like you know yeah yeah you got a hot you got an alcoholic hot Todd and give me that give me give me that hot uh, but yeah I I always love that in the movies where the the parents are just like well we're see it we'll see you we're going out to the the hot party on the block remember you're grounded yeah so we'll talk about tomorrow after mom gets fucking real doggy 
<laughs> we're, we're having weird sex tonight. Costume sex. Um, but, okay, so even jumping further back than that, talking about the Halloween. Again, that's all kind of shoehorned in, just thrown in there. And then there's two, another scene where uh, Eddie comes out on the porch and there's two jack-o'-lanterns. Look like they're thrown together by, uh, you know, a four-year-old who had a hard time navigating the knife because the one the one jack-o'-lantern and i'm not trying to put anybody's artwork down but it's like way asymmetrical the one jack-o'-lantern has all the eyes down at the bottom of the the base of the pumpkin so like so like the poster yeah it's it's uh not my i would say i actually i think i did a post for cold exploitation about the my favorite jack-o'-lanterns from uh halloween movies and this one ain't one of them okay this one didn't hit the hit the mark there uh you know and and then i you know uh, there's always happy accidents but i don't know this one didn't uh this one didn't turn out so hot but anyway they seemed like they were really thrown together and and those scenes were um on like almost an afterthought where they just said hey we need halloween in here for whatever reason we're gonna call this movie trick-or-treat for whatever reason um and they threw all that halloween stuff in so for me it gets a three. Um, I actually, for like half the movie, I forgot that it was Halloween because they kind of just mention it here and there. They're just like, oh, Halloween's coming up. They're like, I don't want to be grounded for Halloween. Um, <laughs> other than that, there's just nothing else happening Halloween-esque. So it's very uh, disappointing Halloween um, festivities that, that go on in this movie. There's no decorations, like nothing in school. Only at the Halloween dance. That's it. And um, no, but nobody has anything on their porches or anything to decorate. Nope. Excuse nope. me, decorate the houses. Nobody's in the Halloween spirit. The trick or treating we gets one fucking kid that shows up like trick or treat, smell my feet, and that's it. Yep. No, this film is a like I said, trick or treat name is a terrible. Yeah, it really, it's really misleading. It doesn't tell you anything about the movie at all. It sounds studio kind of like directed, like the show takes place around Halloween. Got to lure the people in from that. Yep, call it call it trick or treat. Yeah. And, and and they were released on in late October, so. And I feel like the idea of having Halloween there is, you know, just like studios to say, well, as a slasher movie, we need a pull, right? We can't just have. The pull is that it's heavy metal related and that there's a fucking killer who comes back from the grave and harnesses electricity and heavy metal music to do his murders, right? That's the pull. But for producers, they were like, we need another pull. We need something that's going to jump out to audiences right away. So they're like, well, center it around a holiday. And what, you know, what holiday would make sense as a slasher movie than Halloween? So it definitely does feel like production came in and said this, you know, we, we spent fucking three bill, three million dollars on this movie. Where did it go? For one thing, where did it go? Ozzy pocket it. Who, who, who took it? <laughs> the film looks like shit. <laughs> um, um, how much did you spend on that stereo that you smashed? Um, st- stuff like that. So they were like, we need to recoup. Uh, let's just put a holiday in here and get the hook. Um, so that's that's what I that's how I envision that happening. Um, they just made him have a holiday, so in Halloween made the most sense. So um, yeah, it's not a great Halloween movie. But how do you feel about it as a slasher movie? What do you what do you think? I don't even really think it's a slasher movie. Not a lot of slashing actually happens. No, and uh, ending killing it, it's very tame and off screen and you know, actually. Even- even um, some of the scenes where you would expect there to be a, like a slasher type killing doesn't actually happen. Like I'm thinking about the girl um, who's um, um, what's his name, the jock's girlfriend, um, Haney. Yeah, it's Jeannie's girl. Jeannie is uh, the girlfriend, and she's in the uh, truck, and she's just kind of been rebuffed by Haney. He's like, "I'm out of here," and. Um, so she puts on the uh, cassette player that is a tape that Eddie gave to Haney because he's basically recorded like a evil curse onto the tape or whatever, or whatever you want to call it. 
And so she's starting to listen to it, and she's getting all hot and heavy because whatever's on that tape, man, sexy. Sexy shit. Makes you want to go to finger bank. That's what she was doing. And then all of a sudden she sees like a demon thing in front of her, like almost like a gargoyle with like a huge tongue. And at that point, if it was working at that point, just go with it, right? She she freaks out, but I, I feel like you'd just be like, okay, you know. Tongue's doing the tongue's business. I don't know. How you see a tentacle head tie? <laughs> Just roll with it. Roll with it. Yeah. But um, anyway, in that scene, you would expect like, oh, she's going to be dead, right? There's something that's going to happen to her. She's going to get slashed, whatever. But instead, she just has her ears fried. Like, they start to, like, melt within the, the headphones. And then she's, later on, they're like, well, she could have died. But she didn't. She just has... You know, 30% hearing now in both ears and uh, had ear reconstruction surgery. But she's going to be okay. So the film, even when you expect there to be killings, there really isn't. And it doesn't kind of, it doesn't pan out. Which is a weird, it's kind of puts this movie in a weird situation. Because it's not, it's, it's kind of got an interesting idea to it. And that, you know, you've got the heavy metal element. You've got this whole play on is heavy metal dangerous because of its violence and sexual nature and things like that. And, you know, you've even got Ozzy Osbourne playing a priest who's delivering that information to us. Um, And then at the same time, it is very bland for the most part. It really doesn't have a lot of good, you know, sequences of actual violence that would really bring an audience into the movie um it feels like it's something like a nightmare on elm street but it doesn't have the the ideas to pull off that element no it does it it doesn't have like the fun gravitas to it like again like something as simple as like ozzy his cameo is like a little fun you know of him playing like a, a reverend it would have been fun if, like, when he's pulling out an album of, like, this devil music, if he's pulling out Blizzard of Oz, like, you know, like, look, like, this is, like, basically say, like, buy my shit, you know. <laughs> would have been fun. He just pulls out something, you know, random that's kind of immaterial. But, I mean, like, the fact that, like, again, I think the biggest problem with the film is the fact that, like, if, if you're going to go with this heavy metal route, and the whole satanic panic and the whole PRMC thing. You should have had somebody kind of play Sammy Kerr or whoever. Have somebody that has, like, you know, is within it to kind of make it more tongue in cheek fun. Tony Fields isn't bad, but overall, like, the whole idea is fun. And I think it is pretty good. But I think the problem the film has is it's an hour and 40. It should be like an hour and 20, maybe an hour and 15 or an hour and 10. It's like a very elongated episode of like, are you afraid? <laughs> and it has its fun moments, but it is beyond intolerably long times for something as simple as it is. And there's no, like, as you said it, you say this is a slasher. I wouldn't call this a slasher at all. Because there's no slashing. There's no real violence. All the violence that takes place is off screen. Or not really, like, affected. He's more like fucking Doc Brown popping in and out like, Ronnie, we gotta, we, we gotta go to the Metallica classroom. This <laughs> be a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, I do agree with the Are You Afraid of the Dark? Or, you know, that, that sort of reference because... I do get that sense at times um, if it had toned down maybe like some of the bullying a little bit because some of the bullying does get you know and we we discussed this and I thought the exact same thing as you it does get like school shooter esque like where fucking Eddie you know obviously wearing a patch very reminiscent of you know the Columbine shooters in some <laughs> scenario um, where he basically gets bullied constantly by the jocks who here again look like they're you know 35 years old held back five times um <laughs> they they you know it does go into that a little bit and it, it kind of deals with the bullying aspect uh to a pretty ex- extreme levels you know of course um eddie 
he gets he comes goes to a pool party he gets like a basically like a weight or an anvil whatever the fuck they found at the side of the pool shoved into his backpack and they throw him into the water and he obviously can't swim with that and they kind of play it off like I don't know why he's so mad but it's just a weight in there it's just a joke it's a prank um good time you have him like stripped naked and then thrown out into the middle of the gym where cheerleaders are practicing and he gets uh you know a photo taken of him and naked um it's stuff yeah I like too it's like got that GTA as soon as that like Polaroid shot he's like wasted like <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah uh, I mean stuff like that it's kind of to the extreme but then again like the way that the film kind of treats the idea of, of Sammy coming and being a villain is very Are You Afraid of the Dark-esque where not much happens to people um, I do think that there are some killings at the end and uh, you know electrocutions and stuff like that but it's it's all kind of in like a jokey manner that doesn't really ever get to the point where it's you know, to the extent of other slasher films like Friday the 13th, which is, you know, in its later iterations was very gory and kind of went to the extremes, or A Nightmare on Elm Street, which really played up the idea of, of dreams and the creativity of what you could do with those, and also got very creative with its deaths. This movie doesn't really have that, and it doesn't go to very extreme lengths to show murder in that capacity. Um, not, not only that, too, though, I mean... <laughs> Eddie's not really, I mean, he's not really that metal. <laughs> oh, my penis is hanging out. You know what be metal? Turn around and be like, hello, ladies. <laughs> not approving that, but I mean, like, you know, be metal. Like, be, Rick, you know, Rick Flair. I, I think that's what Sammy's trying to teach him. It's funny because later on when he's first, you know, hearing the record and he's playing the record back and Sammy just says something like, let the big fish come to you. <laughs> like, be the bait um it's kind of funny because it's just like okay that's you know that's not like villain-esque that's just like you should give him some good advice right he's just you know and and then he kind of takes it to the extreme and it would have been funny if sammy was like what the fuck are you doing dude i i didn't mean that i just meant like you know like fight back a little bit i didn't i didn't mean don't be such a pussy yeah (laughs) i didn't mean like fucking murder a guy (laughs) Well, that done it. Yeah. But no, I mean, like, it's funny because he's like, I'm, I like metal. I like, I like, I like poison. Which they're, they're not metal. But I like, I like this stuff. I like your thrice. Come on, guys. Bring the noise. Come on. Why are you making fun of my butt? Well, it's funny, too, because the, the movie, you know, it kind of has the opposite of what a lot of 80s movies had, where you had, like, the black all denim punk yeah. guys with the uh vests in um Friday, Friday the 13th part three yeah you know, the, the punks at the bar and like <laughs> you know yeah you had you had that sort of thing and this movie kind of takes it the opposite direction you have these like really preppy jock guys and at one point at the pool party the one, one girl what was her name again Jeannie Jeannie yeah yeah she comes up to Eddie and she's like why are you so creepy why can't you just be normal why are you so creepy like like he's like no, no. What's great is when she's like, he's like, what do you mean? He's like, see, if you weren't creepy, you would. <laughs> yeah, you would. You would know what I meant. And then, but it, then she's like, do you even know who's running for school council? I was like, that's like the lamest thing I've ever, <laughs> I've ever heard. Like that would be somebody that would be really nerdy. No, the film entered Japanese like anime territory. Like respect the school president. <laughs> oh, the school president. You know, like, yeah, like if, if you were metal, you'd be like, Who the fuck cares? Yeah, who cares about the school council? No, have no you one. listened to British Steel? <laughs> <laughs> hey, kids, did you know uh, Turbo Lover is about to come out by Judas Priest? Let's listen to that. I know, I mean, you would think that that Eddie would be the cool kid. Uh, hey, hey, have you listened to Ride the Lightning yet? He's even, fucking even now, like, Eddie's friend, too. Um, what's his name? Uh, nerd, nerd bag. Yeah, like he, he <laughs> Roger, Roger. He even has like more of what you would con- like for now. <clears throat> you would have like the popular look because he's got like those horn rimmed glasses. He's like like the actual. Uh, Amory look is in these days. Yeah, it kind of is. Like you know, it's kind of like uh, um, kind of like a jokey way of being nerdy, but you're not. You know that he's kind of got that look in this movie. 
Um, and it's funny. I, the other thing I really like too, you know, uh, like that instance where he picked up the phone and he was like, we just got call waiting. We just got <laughs> call waiting. I feel like a right proper businessman. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> And that's great. I wish I wish you could do that for cell phones. Just be like, when someone calls, we just put them on hold for on purpose. Like, hold. Imagine doing that to every telemarketer that calls now. I know, right? Fuck, mm. fuck you, Indian guy, trying to steal my credit card. <laughs> <laughs> you know what we haven't talked about, but this movie has the very um, tried and true, stereotypical girl who's obsessed with the main character, even though she really has no reason or right to be. Right, because that's that's also no, and uh, what what what's she crushing about Eddie? What's Leslie see in Eddie besides his mullet? I think it's more like the the lost puppy dog sort of thing. It's like I can fix this guy, you know. Um, what, Don't worry, in two years I'll have him listening to the pig season note. It's kind of like the same thing with Nightmare on Elm Street too, um, where you have. You know, the, the main character who's kind of like a, a, a dorky, geeky guy. He gets bullied and you have one girl who's just like, I felt bad for him. And then they, they fall in love. It, the same thing that happens here. This is sort of like the same idea that happens over and over again, especially in the 80s. Where you had like the geeks, at least in some other movies, though, the geeks had like charming elements to them that you were like, oh, OK, I see why she would be interested. In this movie, it's really hard to find why Leslie even cares because Eddie's constantly an asshole to her. Uh, after the pool party, he's like, you set me up, even though he really has no right to even think that. And then later on, he just says really random, bizarre stuff to her, like, I like your jeans. They really suit you. <laughs> At that point, you're like, you are going to be a school shooter. I think I think Tommy Wiseau sat down and wrote, took notes. He's like, yeah, pretty much. He's like, oh, real, real bizarre. Well, hello, doggy. You're my favorite customer. So, OK, bye. I mean, at the same time, though, are you going to say, I really like your receptionist outfit, Leslie? <laughs> you know, your your four-inch turtleneck sweater. I really love it. I don't know. Right. You don't know what kind of neck she has. She's packing behind. That's right. Yeah, that's the, the whole appeal, the charm. It's, it's full-on protected. The, I can't yeah. tell you the last time if I've ever even worn a turtleneck. I feel like it. Mine was like fourth grade or something like that. Like, like I don't know what the purpose of such discomfort. <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, it, it's just bugging me the whole day. I know, I know. I mean, she does. She has that like receptionist at thirty-five going home to the kids look down in this movie, especially when you first meet her. She's got the turtleneck and the business suit on. It's great. Um. What do you think? Like, how do you like the uh, the fast way music in this movie? Man, because they do the whole soundtrack. It's literally the most like generic '80s metal ever. It really is. It really it's is. like it's like Love Fist from Vice City, but not as charming as. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I feel like the the songs like like you kind of hit it on the head. It's like very generic. The songs are so generic, and they don't have the. And, you know, there's multiple of them, too. So that's another problem with this movie is, like, you have multiple songs. They don't really stick with the viewer. But none of them really have, a, a like, a riff that's, oh, yeah, that's really like, a, wow. You know, like, wow, I love that that song. That song's re- really catchy. None the of them movies, have that. The movie's too busy with, like, the soundtrack having, like, uh, satanic metal playing where it's just, like, <laughs> like, you know, like a shitty version of Van Halen's Eruption. Just, like, you know random noodling throughout and it's not like really like endearing because mm-hmm. it's not there's nothing to it there's like you said there's no hook like if anything like you know like you should have done that like if you're gonna make like uh this movie be about you know heavy metal music luring people in this would make me go put that boon on this is terrible yeah it, it needed something it needed something um I don't know. It, it the the soundtrack is fine, but it just doesn't really end up being anything that's memorable. All I need to do is license Quiet Riot's like bang your head and just have that fucking play for an hour and a half. That's right. Would have been a lot better. Yeah, 
I, I, I mean, I think Fastway. The the one thing that's interesting about Fastway is that it has the the lead singer in in Fastway is also the lead singer in Flogging Molly, which is kind of like a crazy jump between the two. Really still interesting. Though. Still don't believe. You. Well, that's true. You got to look it up. I know I have. But... Everybody will have to go and look it up now. But yeah, I I I just think that's quite interesting. But. Yeah, the soundtrack is fine, but it doesn't really have that pull that you're expecting from a movie that's like the heavy metal horror movie. Just doesn't have it. Um, and I think we kind of talked about this too, but like the the actual kills and the gore is really just not there, at least in my opinion. Um, it's to the point even where it's got a humorous element at the end where it looks like Rogers died. He's gotten electrocuted by the uh, you know smashing a electric box. And uh, Eddie's like, he's dead. And then Roger just sits up and he's like, no, actually, I'm not. I'm okay. Yeah. It's kind of like, that's like sums up the movie in that, like, everybody's just okay. <laughs> you know, this this Sammy Kerr, he's not really a menace. He's just kind of annoying. <laughs> you know, like that, when he zaps you, it's not like he kills you. He just, it's like Yu-Gi-Oh. I banish you to the shadow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's like, you're mildly annoying. <laughs> you been inconvenience. <laughs> what do you think about the ending uh, where they have to get rid of Sammy Kerr by both getting, like, basically like getting rid of him in bodily form and then also smashing all of the recordings that have him on it? It's okay, but it's kind of stupid because he's tied to electricity. How the hell does him... Like Christina a car make him go away from the tape. Seeing as he's been on the tape and the other well, the acetate tape and the record and the cassette, like that doesn't make any sense. If he's connected to electricity, shouldn't he be able to like be in a bunch of different places at the same time? You would think, right? Like I the the film doesn't really go into um much detail about how that works, in my opinion. It he can sometimes he can disappear, sometimes he is stuck in one place because there's a police bar- barrier in front of him. I don't know. It doesn't, you know. I think the ending is okay, but it's sort of anticlimactic where they just drive him off a bridge and she smashes the recording and it's like, that's it. He's done. And then the film kind of just ends. It's just like, all right, that's it. We're done. Game over. Um, Anything else that we didn't talk about that you can think of so we didn't bring up I did like uh, the first time around when uh, he does uh, like follow the backwards music which also is a nice you know call to the satanic panic and stuff like putting the music on backwards reveals you know these satanic messages and he follows the advice at first and it's like harmless pranks like the way he just goes up originally to Tim and be like, hey Tim, what? He just smacks like his fucking cafeteria tripping. <laughs> and then like he's got like these home alone traps as he's like running away. Made me laugh really hard. Like that was a lot of Yeah, that was I, I did like that bit really fun. Where they yeah, where they run yeah. run through the, the school and one guy yeah. slides out the door. <laughs> like I didn't think that was a lot of fun. Yeah, that one is fun, and it's kind of funny too when he leads him to the, uh, the like the the teachers' lounge, sprays everybody with the uh, the uh, fire extinguisher. Fire hydrant, yeah, that's nice. I've, I've been put on janitorial duty. Yeah, that is that is nice. That's a, that's a good bit. What do you think of Gene Simmons in this? We didn't talk about that. We talked about Ozzy, but we didn't talk about Gene. I mean, he really doesn't really get that much time to be in the the movie. Like, there's just that one scene, basically, at the beginning where he's, you know, the disc jockey and comes in, uh, Eddie comes in, basically whining at him. Uh, then kind of, he kind of gets to espouse some uh, some knowledge. Really. He's like, he's just a guy. You don't know him. You know, he's your idol, but you don't, you've never met him before. Uh, which I did like. But other than that, I don't think, like, he gets much time to even I think Ozzy probably gets more time to really solidify his place in this movie so um 
I don't know. It, it, it was fine, but he doesn't... I just, it just wasn't that memorable. All right, so we're going to give this movie a rating. Um, so on a scale of 0 to 10 um, wannabe Rambos, what would you give Trick or Treat? I'll give it a 6 out of 10. And spot it off. Like, it does have, like, a nice, like, idea. Like, I do like the whole, like, satanic panic in the metal idea. I do think it works pretty well for the most part. Uh, up until, like, the, you know, first, like, 40 minutes. It's pretty fun. I think when it goes, like, kind of meandering into the slasher sci-fi territories where it kind of loses the plot and it does become overwrought and goes on for too long, it does have very much a Are You Afraid of the Dark episode feel. It's very kid showy for the most part, outside of like the tits and shit. With like the whole violence aspect is very muted, so to call it the slasher, I, f- I can't do that. But it does have some fun, interesting ideas. I do think it would have worked a lot better if for the music. You didn't have, like, a set, like, band playing the whole fucking score if you had, you know, one good licensed song and maybe somebody worth a damn from the metal scene attached to play Sammy, like, at at Alice Cooper. It would be a lot more meaningful and impactful because the acting, though not bad in this film, is very wooden across the board. Everybody's incredibly wooden and stilted and not really too enjoyable. But in spite of all that, I did have enough fun. I don't think, like, because I didn't think it was a bad film by any means. Did I enjoy it that much? Not that much, but again, like, I, I, I don't, I don't, like, it's a very average film. So six out of ten kind of. For all, at least with our grading scale, if it's the bill, it's a, a very average middling film. It's and very inoffensive, and I can see why this film kind of over the years probably disappeared into the night because there's not much sticking up for it. But it's there's a lot worse that you can do for Halloween. Films. Yeah, I re- I'd probably give it a five and a half out of ten. I thought it was fine. Um, it doesn't really have much staying power. I think it. I thought it was a little too long. Like, I, I checked about half an hour in, and I was like, wow, this movie's got to be almost done. And it was not even close. Um, I think that, you know, the idea is interesting. It's got kind of a fun aesthetic to it with the heavy metal elements, but it just doesn't really come together that well. I do agree that it has sort of like a, are you afraid of the dark slash goosebumps element to it that um, kind of prevents it from being, from competing with like the big slasher movies of the time. Um, pair that with the fact that it's named Trick or Treat, but it really doesn't have much Halloween element to it at, at all. And I think you're kind of working your, yourself up for disappointment because you're expecting uh, heavy metal slasher, you're expecting Halloween, and the film doesn't really deliver on that too much. Um, it has its its kind of fun elements to it. It has um, you know high school hijinks and stuff like that, but it really doesn't deliver the things that you're expecting it to. And I think that's probably the biggest problem is that it's, you know, there's an expectation here and it doesn't really fulfill it. Um, it probably could have been a little bit more um, successful in what it did uh, if it had maybe tapped into creativity a little bit more, uh, gone even further into like the Nightmare on Elm Street route. Um, I think that would have done the film a little bit better. But as it stands, it's fine a little bland, a little boring at times. Um, so I don't think it's the best uh, of the 80s slashers that came out of that time frame. But as Martin said, there are far worse. So um, it might be worth a watch, you know, if you're interested in heavy metal and want to get a, a taste for what this offers. So. um, All right, next time, what are we doing? Are we going back to nostalgia stuff? Is it finally time for Hocus Pocus? I thought we were doing Saw next. Oh, that's right. That's right. Saw is on the horizon. Uh, that releases this Friday, right? So, yeah. yeah, I mean, it would make sense. If we can get to the theater and see it, it makes sense to do Saw. 
How long is this film? Um, I'm going to guess it's probably like an hour and 40, right? That'd be my guess. So, Colvin Bell requires three hours. <laughs> it's two it's hours. It's two hours long. It's two God. hours. <clears throat> Damn it. Out. God. Damn it. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> yeah. Um. All right. Well, yeah. Saw 10 is on the plate for next time. Um. God, Shawnee Smith is just... She must have ran out of that Becker money. I can't wait. <laughs> I feel like I need to do some studying to even be prepared for it. Go back and watch two and three at least. And one. Make sure I remember the fuck all the events. I may have to too. Um yeah. So I thought well, but like it's it's like when did we do the Saw movies? Because I can tell you right now, when we did Saw for, uh, which, no, so not like nine years ago, when we did the Saw retrospective, it has our, like, first big Halloween thing. Uh, yeah, I, that's the last time you watched it, so. Any of them, yeah, so, I mean. Yeah, so we'll have to, uh, get prepared for that. Well. Thanks for listening to our episode on Trick or Treat. I hope you had fun. Um, you need to emphasize, too. You're saying trick or treat. Trick, trick or, treat. or treat. Trick or treat. Start yelling it. Trick or treat. Either or. Let, in that one. Let everyone know so they know. Like, That's right. I like to say trick or treat. Trick or, trick or treat when I say the other one. So Trick or treat. Um, hope you enjoyed. Revolve. Revolved. Uh body tawdry <laughs> any of those adjectives um hope you enjoyed this episode uh hope you come back for our episode on saw 10 and continue our halloweenies festival uh, as we go through the rest of october into halloween um if you want to keep up with that subscribe to us on any podcast app that you can think of we're on google podcasts uh, which is actually going away just so you know apple Podcasts, uh our home base at anchor.fm which is now spotify so subscribe on there leave us a nice review appreciate that we are also on twitter and facebook just search for us on there blood and black rum podcast we have an email address at blood and black rum podcast at gmail.com you can write to us let us know what you like what you don't like what movies you want us to cover take that in consideration and you can also donate to us you know donate to us on spotify or on our patreon page either way that goes back towards beer so we appreciate that in advance um other than that Hope you tune in next time for our episode on Saw 10. And uh, until then, take care.